title of today's sermon is called, If You Love Me. If You Love Me. Today I want to share with you three different passages. John chapter 14, verse 15. John chapter 19, verse 30. And Mark chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. Um, Because all three of these verses is very important. And I want to share with you a message specifically based on these three passages. Let's read these verses together. John chapter 14, verse 15. Let's read it together. Let's begin. If you love me, you will obey what I command. One more time. If you love me, you will obey what I command. John chapter 19, verse 30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Mark chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. Let's read it together. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. The three passages that we read today, to me, in my opinion, is one of the most profound statements the Bible has given to us. Now, I think throughout the Bible, it's filled with profound statements. But in my opinion, these three passages, the words that are stated here, are the three of the most profound statements that was given to us, at least given to me. If you love me, you will obey what I command. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And Matthew chapter 10, verse 18 says, Only God is truly good. Only God is truly good. I think throughout our lives, even as Christians and believers, let me, I'm sorry to stop. Are you guys cold? It's okay? I want you to be comfortable. Okay. As a Christian, I've been a Christian now for what? Since I was 21. So I've been a Christian now for 10 years. Okay, you missed that. Okay. <laughs> I've been a Christian now nearly for 20 years. And, um, and throughout the Bible, we read many things. But there's, these are the passages that I think many Christians we don't preach on or we don't dwell on. We don't dwell on this passage. Only God is truly good. Have we thought about that? And we don't think about the words, if you love me, you will obey. You know, throughout my life, you know, we use the word love often. And usually when we say the word love, you know, we say, you know, if you love me, you will, you will, you know, give me presents. If you love me, you know, you will say nice things to me. You know, if you love me, you will do the dishes. You know, if you love me, do this and that and that. We say all these things about love, but we rarely ever hear the statement, whether on television or even from other people's mouth, if you love me, you will obey me. And in my opinion, the reason why we don't really think about these things is because as Christians, I don't think we don't really truly realize how true and how profound these two statements are. If you love me, you will obey my commandments, and only, only God is truly good. When I, was a, when I was pastoring in America, out of necessity, I had to teach a parenting class, a parenting for teen, parents with teenagers. Because usually um, parents don't realize that they need help with parenting until kids become teenagers. Isn't that true? And the reason for that is oftentimes, you know, when children are young, you know, they obey. When children are young, you know, usually, you know, you can control them with a little bit of fear, you know, with the rod and a stick, you know. Usually with my son and my daughter, you know, they may not listen. But if I say, what, William? You know, just a little, you know, you know mean, angry tone and... You know, that does the trick, you know, or we say, you want time out? They're like, okay, okay. Or, oh, you know, you want a spanking? Usually those are the things. It does the trick. When the children are young, you can usually control them, and they'll obey you when you do those things. But as parents, we realize that as children reach adolescence and beyond, that the same old tactic that we use no longer works. In fact, you know, when you tell them, hey, why don't you do this? And, you know, when they reach adolescence, they start talking back to you. It's like, no, I don't want to do it. Be home by 10 o'clock. And they show up at 11. Do the dishes. Dishes are undone. He said, no, don't talk back to me. And then they'll talk back even more. And the parents are like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to control my kids. And, 
And as a pastor, I realized that, you know, we have to meet the needs of our congregation. So I started a parenting class for teenagers, and I actually done like six sessions of that, and I had close to 100 parents go through that class. The reason why the parenting technique that we use when when our children are young no longer works when they get older is because as our children get older, authoritative parenting doesn't work. Because when a child gets older, they need to know why. And when a child gets older, it's not just the matter of they're my parents, but it's now a matter of do I want to obey my parents. So parenting style has to evolve and change. And instead of being authoritative, as, as it evolves, parents has to use more of a relationship, relationship you know, parenting style with their children. But the problem is that too many parents still try to maintain an authoritative relationship with their teenagers. And for many parents, they come to realize that it simply doesn't work. When we have, uh, what we have to understand is that the parent-child relationship is, an, is nothing like the relationship that we have at work, a manager or an employee. But too often we learn leadership, you know, from textbooks and we learned uh, parenting from our work. We think that we can control our employees or maybe even our students, you know, the same way we can control our children and it doesn't, simply doesn't work that way. At work, people may obey out of fear of being fired or not being promoted or not getting a bonus. So you obey your boss at work even if you don't like them, even if you're not friends with them. Why? Because they are your boss. They control your livelihood. If you don't obey, they, can, they have the power and the authority to say, you are fired. If you don't obey, they have the power and the authority maybe not to give you a promotion. If you don't obey, maybe they have the authority and the power not to give you a bonus. So in our workplace, we can use that authoritative type of relationship to control the people to obey us. Because there's a strong intrinsic relationship, uh, motivation, in our workforce, in our workplace. But that doesn't apply in parenting, and that doesn't apply with our children. What many parents fail to realize is that when a child rebels, when our children do not listen to us, they're rebelling. When our child rebels, our child is not rebelling against the rules or the regulations that you set. When a child rebels or disobeys, they're rebelling against the person, or in this case, the parents. When I talk to children, most often the reason they give for their disobedience is really not based on unreasonable demands by the parents, but more so because of the deteriorating relationship that they have with their parents. Too often we think that our children disobey because they're bad children. But from my experience, from talking to literally hundreds of children, and maybe, you know, and, and dozens and dozens of parents, what I come to realize is that most parents are very similar. There are always some extreme cases where some parents are super strict, and there are always some cases where some parents are very lenient. But what I found out is that most parents are pretty much the same. They want their children to be home at reasonable hours. They want their children to do their homework before, watch, you know, watching television. They want their children not to talk back but to be respectful. They all want their children to help out a little bit around the house. And those are really very common, not unreasonable, and most parents are pretty much the same. But when I talk to the children who are rebellious against their parents, and when I talk to the children who are very obedient to their parents, what I've come to realize is that when children rebel, they're not rebelling against the rules or the regulations, even though children may complain about them. When you, you know, look deep down into their hearts, you realize that what the children are rebelling against are against the parents. They're just merely using the rules and the laws and saying they're unfair, it's unreasonable. They're just using that as an excuse to rebel against their parents or reacting to the bad relationship that they might have. And when I talk to the children who are very obedient, and this is what I found out, some of their parents are, tend to be what I found to be very strict. Some parents says no TV throughout the whole school week, only on weekends. 
Some parents, they don't let their daughters go out on their own. They won't let their daughters go out on their own to the malls and stuff like that with other children. I've seen some parents, you know, who, you know, they have like, you know, earlier cur curfew. During weeknights, be home by 9. Weekends, be home by 10. While some kids, they can, you know, stay out till 11, 12. Can't parents trust them? Even though some of these parents are very strict, these children obey their parents. And when I look into the reason why they obey, is the answer became very clear. It's simply because they have a very good relationship with their parents. It's because they love their parents. It's because they respect their parents. And it's because they love them, and it's because they respect them, they want to obey. When the relationship is bad, no matter how reasonable the rules and the regulations or the guidelines might be, the children, the child, will find one reason or another to disobey. But when you have a good relationship, even sometimes if the demands are difficult, we obey simply out of love. What I want to share with you today is this. That is the basic essence of what Christianity is all about. That is the basic essence of what Christianity is all about. It's a loving relationship between our God and us. And everything else that happens you know, around us, everything that happens in our lives, and everything that happens, everything that we do, is a result of that loving relationship between, between our God and us. But the problem is that there are many people around the world who are not Christians. They have this wrong understanding, misconception, about what Christianity is all about. Even for myself, growing up, I had this wrong image about Christianity. Growing up, I used to think that Christianity was all about rules and regulations. I thought Christianity was all about do this, you can't do that, you shouldn't do that, that's not good for you, that's bad, that's wrong. That was the image and perception that I have about Christianity. I thought that the reason why Christians didn't smoke, some Christians didn't smoke, or some Christians, the reason why they didn't curse, or they didn't gamble, they didn't drink, or spend time, or, you know, when I see some of the Christians, they spend time with their family, or when they go to church, go to prayer meetings, and when they go to mission trips, when they give offering, all of these things that they did and they didn't do, my understanding before I became a Christian was that they did it because this is what God commanded them to do. And in order to be a Christian, you had to obey God. So when I saw, you know, these Christians who went to church every Sunday, I said, they're going because that's what God commanded them to do. When I saw Christians who refused to, you know, use profanity during conversation, I said to myself, I guess they're doing that because that's what God told them to do. Certain Christians in, in the workforce, they don't drink. In fact, during my workplace this week, you know, it was into the school year, so they invited all the teachers out to dinner or yeah, dinner. And in Korean culture, what do they serve along with food? Alcohol, yeah, beer and soju and all these things. And I was the only one who refused to take alcohol. Simply, I said, I don't drink. I don't want to drink. You know what the lady across from me said? She did, she was one of the parents. She says. Wow, you act like a pastor. <laughs> and I said, really? <laughs> and I used to think the reason why Christians did that was simply because that's what God commanded them to do or not to do. And that answer is partly correct, but it's a very small part. And to be honest with you, the reason why I stayed away from Christianity was because I didn't want God controlling my life that way. I didn't want to live that way. I didn't want to feel guilty about drinking or smoking, even though I didn't drink or smoke. I didn't want to feel guilty about going to parties and clubs. I didn't want to feel guilty about, you know, liking girls too much. And being so young... I was attracted to the lifestyle that I felt was unchristlike. 
So I didn't want to become a Christian. Until one day, I experienced a life-changing event. I've been going to church since I was 14 years old because my mom made me. I mean, I've been, I, I went to church even before that, but it was around 14 years of age where we really went consistently. At least I did. And I never really understood the message of God's grace. I never really understood what Christianity was all about. Like I said, I always thought Christianity was a bunch of rules and regulations about do's and don'ts, ought and ought not. I always thought that being a Christian meant making a commitment to obey God. And then one day, at the age of 21, I understood. My eyes were opened. And the verse, Romans 5, verse 8 and 9, this truth was revealed to me. It says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. You know, you hear this passage, you hear the word grace often, but you never really think about it, you never really meditate on it. But the Bible tells us that while we were still sinners, and to simplify the term sinners means that we do things that displease God, that dishonors God, that goes against God and who He is. So if I wanted to put it in a very simple way, while we were still liars and cheaters and robbers and adulterers, while we were rebellious, while we were you know, judgmental, while we were doing all of these things, not that we were good, not because we had any good in us, but when we had all this wickedness, God died for us. And what this passage told me was this, that I realized that Christianity was not about us trying to be good. But what I really came to realize was that Christianity was about God who was good. Now again, this is a very simple statement, but I think most of us, we don't meditate on this truth. Christianity, it's not, uh, it's not about us being good, but it's about God who is good. Christianity is not about us earning salvation, but about God in the person of Jesus who already sacrificed himself so that we don't have to earn it. It was at that moment I understood this, the words that Jesus uttered on the cross, the last words that he uttered before he died when he said, It is finished. For the longest time, I'm like, why would he say that? Why would he say that it is finished? Only a person with a mission and a purpose would say that. And Jesus' purpose was to die for us, die in our place. Why? Because God knew that we will never, ever be good enough. That we will never, ever be good enough to save ourselves. So he took our pit in place and he died for us. He sacrificed his life for our life. And when that mission was done, he uttered those words, it is finished. He meant that we don't have to do anything to earn salvation. We don't have to do anything to earn salvation. It meant that all the work was done by God for us. You know, I think maybe every religion might say this, but I know this to be true. But Christianity is unique. I really do not like it when people refer to Christianity as one of the religion. I don't like the term religious. I don't have religion. I have relationship with God. One thing to me I know to be true that separates Christianity from all other religion is the fact that 
Christianity doesn't tell us that we have to be good. See, I used to think that that's what Christianity was. But now I realize that that, that was just the opposite. Christianity tells us that we don't have to be good to go to heaven or to earn God's favor. While certain religions tell us that we have to be good or do good things or good works to achieve enlightenment. Other religion tells us that we have to be good or do good works to become gods ourselves. And then there's another religion that tells us that we have to be good or do good works to break karma. While other, another religion tells us that we have to do good work or earn or earn certain, certain thing, earn a place in paradise. But the Bible, on the contrary, tells us that we are not good. Not only does it say we don't have to be good, but the Bible tells us we are not good. Mark chapter 10, verse 17 and 18 says, As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him and knelt down and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This man asked Jesus a question, good teacher. He was just referring to him with the title, good teacher, showing respect. and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, using that question to answer that question, said to him, why do you call me good? And he said, only God is truly good. When the man came to, uh, came to Jesus and asked this question, that wasn't really the answer that he was looking for. How do we go to heaven? And Jesus' response to him was, cause, was this, Why do you call me good? Only God is good. Because Jesus knew that this man, growing up in a, you know, in a uh, Judeo, you know, uh, Judeo culture, he knew that this person's understanding of Going to heaven was that you have to work at it, you have to uh, earn it, you have to do all these good things, you have to do rituals, you have to pray certain times, you have to give certain offering. He grew up in this culture. So did Jesus wanted to tell him from the very beginning, you know, you cannot, you cannot go to heaven by simply being good. And he told him, you know what? There's no one that is good. Only God and God alone is good. Romans 3, verse 23 says, For everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. You see, we all, none of us in this room are good. Because for some of us in other religion, even the acts that they do, the good works that they do, it's really, we cannot consider it to be truly good or purely good because their goodness is tainted. When we try to be good and do good works, so that we can become gods, ultimately the goodness that we show is self, selfish motivated. We're doing it because we want to attain godship. Ultimately, if we're doing good because if, you know, we, want, we feel like by doing good works, we can break a bad karma, then ultimately the goodness is not purely good because it is still tainted by selfish motive. Because we want to break bad karma. If we do good and if we help the poor and we give and you know, help the sick and heal the sick and do all, make all the sacrifice because in the back of our mind if we believe that by doing so we can go to heaven then ultimately those acts are not purely good because it's again tainted by our selfish motivation. So the Bible is absolutely right. Jesus was absolutely correct when he said there's no one that is good except God alone. And when Jesus uttered those statements, he was not doing it with pride or arrogance. He was stating the fact, and he wanted this man to understand that you cannot go to heaven by doing good deeds. You cannot earn your way to heaven. Because we will always fall short of God's glory. It was then I realized why Christians live their lives the way they did. All these years, I used to think that you know, Christians, they don't smoke, even though they are some. Don't get me wrong. I don't want you to go around and say, he must not be a Christian because he smokes. 
Uh, there are Christians who smoke, but there are many who don't. And I used to think, well, they don't smoke because I guess God told them to, told them not to. And all these years I grew up thinking these Christians who, who did not use profanity, curse, or swear, I thought, oh, they're doing it because God told them to. And that's partly true. But what I really came to realize was that the reason why Christians don't do that, it's not because it was written in the Bible or God commanded them to do so. But it was simply a response to their loving relationship with God. See, I realized that Christians did what they did not because they were commanded to do so, but more so because of their love for God. Because if you love me, you will obey my commandments. I mentioned 19, 19 years ago, I became a Christian. And the reason for that was because I came to realize two important truths. One of that was that God was truly real. I mean, it's a funny thing to say, you know, 90% of the people in this world believe that God exists. And I said that words too, you know, God exists. But I never truly believed that from my own personal belief deep down inside. But one day, I came to realize that there has to be a God. But more, uh, but more importantly, the truth that really changed my life was the realization that that amazing, almighty God loved me and cared for me. You see, growing up, I used to think I was such a, I was a hot stuff. Hot stuff means that I thought I was better than other people. I thought I was cooler than other people. Cooler means I was, well, how do you explain cooler? Uh, that I was opposite of me? <laughs> I thought I was better than other people. I thought I was, um, uh, I was more likable. I thought I was more respected. I thought, um, you know, on a, this is really how I felt, and I shared this. When I went to church, as a teenager, and when I would look at other teenagers my age at church, I would often think to myself, man, these nerds, you know the term nerds? Nerds are like, you know, people wear big, thick glasses, and the only thing they do is study. They don't play sports, they don't do anything else, they don't have girlfriends or boyfriends, all they do is study, you know? You know, we call them nerds. And I used to think to myself, when I come to church, these nerds, they're so lucky to have a cool guy like me come to church. When I was young, I used to think that I was so good. I had good personality. I was fun. I had a lot of good qualities. I could play sports. I was funny. I had a sense of humor, as well as being handsome. And that was my attitude growing up. But the funny thing is, I don't know why I thought that way. Because growing up, I was not a very good child. Beginning the age of 15, I started lying to my parents. I was not a good student. I skipped school. I stayed out till 3, 4 o'clock in the morning many times on weekends. I disobeyed my parents. I talked back to them. I yelled at them. I didn't listen to them. And I would chase after girls and, you know, just so that, you know, you know, as a trophy, not necessarily because, you know, I liked them. And when I really look at myself, I realize I was really far from being good. And one day, 
during prayer time because I still went to church because of my mom. It just really occurred to me, it hit me like a lightning bolt. I mean, it, would, it had a powerful impact on me because I realized that God loved me and he cared for me by answering it because he answered some of my prayer requests and it just occurred to me, oh my goodness, God truly hears what I'm saying. And not only did he, does he hear, but he answered my prayers. And it was at that moment I was just overcome. Just my mind was overcome with all these thoughts and memories of really how wicked and how bad I was. And I just couldn't understand that a God so pure, so mighty, so holy could love a liar, someone like me who lied, who cheated, uh, who disobeyed, who rebelled, who lived a selfish life. I just could not imagine how God could love someone like me. And I remember that those, that those moments when I was praying, I was weeping like crazy. And my friends, they just couldn't understand why I was weeping. And they were trying to pray for me. And I couldn't even look up when they were praying for me because they, were, they, were, you know, they didn't know why I was weeping. And they were praying for me, but I couldn't even lift up my head to look at them in the face because I was so ashamed. Because in my heart, I realized how wicked I was and how great God was and how undeserving I was of God's love and grace. And I remember that night I prayed for about 40, 50, 60 minutes. I don't know how long, but it was for a long time. And it was that moment that forever changed my life. When I realized how much God loved me and cared for me, instantaneously, my heart was filled with not only great sense of humility, but also with a great sense of gratitude. And from that, that moment on, no one had to tell me this, but from that moment on, I started going to church four or five times a week. From that moment on, I gave up partying. I gave up chasing after girls. I gave up watching you know, you know, bad movies. From that moment on, I gave up, I didn't drink much, but I gave up smoking. I gave up staying out late. That, from that moment on, I stopped lying to my parents. I stopped deceiving my parents. From that moment on. And the funny thing is, no one had to tell me to do that. In fact, no one told me to do those things. But it was something that I, because I love God so much, I didn't want to put anything else above my love for God. And because I love God so much, I didn't want to do anything to give my God a bad name. So from that moment on, my life was totally changed. It was then I realized what Christianity was again, was all about. See, Christianity is not about being good because only God is good and we will never be good. Christianity is about loving this great and awesome God who became good for us. That is the relationship that we have between us and God. We live our lives in a simple response to God's love, not out of duty or obligation, but simply out of love. When we study the Bible, we see that God does give us directions and guidelines for our benefit. But the thing that God stresses most of all when we look at the Bible is simply, above all, just to love Him. Because God knows if we love Him, we will serve Him. Because God knows that if we love Him, we will follow Him. Because God knows that if we love Him, we will obey Him. And God knows that better than anyone else in this world. Because He is our Father and we are His children. Let us pray.